What's up guys, I'm Alex, the electronics engineer at RealSim World. This time we are presenting the integrated control panel. Needless to explain, we can tell immediately from its location in the cockpit that the ICP is one of the most frequently used instruments by the pilot. The ICP is mounted right on the front face of the HUD, and it makes up what's called the upfront controls in conjunction with the data entry display. They work together enabling the pilot to efficiently manipulate various systems such as communication, navigation, weapons, sensors, and so on. This will be a rather tech-oriented video. I'm going to address the general layout of the ICP, followed by a walkthrough of the advanced software functions. In the end, I will talk about some of the individual components in detail. This ICP is available either pre-assembled or in separate packages. More information on each package can be found on our website, along with the links to our web stores. You can also follow us on Facebook. Although each of the components will be introduced in this video, you still need to visit our website and check out the packing list before placing any orders. You may write to us at this email address if you have further questions. We will write you back once we have read your mails. The ICP comes in two different versions. I'm holding a fully assembled US version. There is also a NATO MLU version which involves an optional infrared sensor. They are virtually identical apart from the aluminum backplates and of course the IR sensor. We will discuss backplates later in this video. At this moment, I will just use the US version in the following demonstration. If you are familiar with the ICP, one thing that immediately catches your attention would be the lack of all the wire spaghetti at the back of this one, and the addition of a circuit board. It's the main controller board, it kind of makes this unit even more integrated than the real one. I mean, of course, for us computer gamers. However, considering the number of cables we intended to stick into the back of this unit, versus the narrow cavity between the ICP and the HUD, we came up with the idea of adding a breakout box through a compact RJ45 cable. This would make the USB cord, the auxiliary power cable, and the main power cable more accessible for much wider places outside of the HUD. All the buttons and rockers are built with extra hard dome switches. The tactile feedback during the actuation process is so distinct that you can't miss it even through a glove. When pressed, they produce a more muffled click than ordinary tactile switches. The thumb wheels are built with a mechanical click at the minimum end, which feels quite distinguishable to the finger. Just like our ATD, the ICP is also backlit and dimmable with an external voltage source. It's known to be tricky to film a glowing object like the backlight here. The real thing looks much better to the naked eye than it appears in this video. The ICP is a plug-and-play hardware. It features a total of 37 joystick buttons. Since some games such as Falcon BMS currently only support up to 32 buttons on a single joystick, we have built the ICP as a composite device formed with a primary and a secondary module. I will be using Helios to demonstrate these two modules simultaneously. It's much better than the legacy Windows Game Controller property sheets, which can present only one joystick at a time. The primary module has four axes, which are the slider, Y rotation, Z rotation, X rotation here, one head switch for point of view, and all the panel buttons and rockers show up as 23 joystick buttons. And the secondary module carries 14 buttons, which cover the Drift Compensation Toggle Switch, the FLIR Gain Level Toggle Switch, the Thumb Wheel Switches, and the DCS Switch in another mode. In order to assign the controls in Falcon BMS, run the game. Enter the setup page and click on controllers tab. The buttons are mapped in the key mapping portion here, and the axes should be assigned in advanced options under avionics control tab. 
HUD brightness should be assigned with the top left SYM thumb wheel, which is supposed to be slider. The text within the BMS drop down list inherits the name strings passed on from Windows. I'm not running an English OS, and BMS apparently doesn't handle Unicode well. That's why it doesn't make sense here. See? It's the same with my Hotas Warthog. Anyway, there's nothing for you guys to worry about if you're using English OS. I'll go ahead and select the slider on the ICP. Yep, movement confirms. Same goes with radical depression. Go ahead and select Y rotation and assign X rotation to HUD FLIR image brightness. Now the axes have been set up properly. Buttons are not affected by the Unicode support issue. If I press any pre-mapped button, the button's number shows up in the input row and the corresponding function appears in the row below. Scroll down halfway in the list to find the ICP section. To edit the key function in the game, left click on its corresponding cell in the key column so it's highlighted. Then press the button you wish to map. The highlight is gone when the mapping has been made. And the new bond is confirmed here. I just corrected the wrong button press. Now let's finish the top row. List. Air to air. Air to ground. Now I have successfully mapped the top row. Let's try a rocker button. Find the FLIR rocker. Level up. And level down. Before we proceed further down the list, it's time for us to do some homework. On top of all the generic axes and buttons, we've added a layer of advanced configurations to optimize the behavior of the ICP under different circumstances. The new RSW console software provides an intuitive visualization of all the configurations available. The software is divided into four major portions. The top row handles hardware and software connectivity. Most of the left portion provides access to the backlight. The middle right portion takes care of the thumb wheels, while the bottom right portion deals with the DCS and toggle switches. I'm starting to sense a lot of curiosity on the thumb wheels. A thumb wheel is essentially a potentiometer coupled with a mechanical switch. At least that's what it used to be. Our controller board only requires the pot, and it's not meant to interface with the switch. It's designed this way because in Falcon BMS, both the HUD power on and off require a separate key assignment, which one single mechanical switch cannot provide anyway. Instead, we've built a pair of software activated virtual switches for each wheel on the left side which are buttons 7, 8, and 9, 10. The cutoff threshold of each wheel is adjustable through this slider. We figured not all of you guys would get those thumb wheels from us. You may prefer your own potentiometers or hall sensors. Either way, when you plug them in, they might not always work in the right direction because of power or magnetic polarity issues. It could be fixed by swapping the power and ground wires, reversing the sensor or the magnet, but sometimes it means a lot of trouble. And as a solution, each axis is individually reversible with our ICP with a single click on the software. SYM normal versus reversed. Now normal again. Same with another one. See? After connecting your thumb wheels, they might not always produce a full range of motion. 
I understand you can fix that with Windows calibration, but when it happens with the two wheels on the left, the off virtual switch might become out of reach. For that reason, each thumb wheel channel can be individually calibrated with our ICP controller hardware. I'll pick a wheel and click on the recalibrate button next to it. Once calibration starts, the axis bar no longer indicates the current position of the wheel within this range of motion. As you move the wheel back and forth, the axis bar would expand from zero and not shrink back. It would be showing the maximum range covered by your movement within the absolute full voltage scale. When this range exceeds 70% of the full voltage scale, you have 5 seconds before the calibration is terminated and the new range data takes effect. Calibration on this axis is completed, and the virtual buttons work like a charm. Now let's talk about the toggle switch. Most three-position toggle switches would have a circuit turned on at either sideway position, but they don't close any circuit at the neutral position. This is called an on-off-on type switch, and two of them are used on the ICP. However, Falcom requires a switch to also send a signal when it returns to the neutral position. In order to solve this problem, we have built what's called a virtual neutral on position for each of them. They are buttons number 2 and 5 on the secondary module. When a toggle returns from either side position, it will trigger the virtual neutral on position, shown here. The sideway position of a toggle comes in either momentary or latched configuration. On the ICP, only the drift compensation position is momentary. All the rest are supposed to be latched. The one I'm using here for the warning reset position is also momentary. This will be replaced on our end products. When a toggle switch is flipped to a latched position, it will remain on until reset. In some games, having a joystick button unintentionally left latched in an on position might block other operations. Without the player's awareness, it could be very frustrating to pinpoint the problem. For this reason, we've given every toggle switch a one-shot mode called Pulse Mode, which allows them to turn themselves off half a second after they are engaged and held in place. They are individually configurable through RSW Council. The game position is button number 4 here, currently under Level Mode. It remains on until reset. Click Pulse. It self-clears. Now if you look back at the virtual buttons for the thumb wheels, you will find these options are also available for them. Some users may prefer to calibrate their axes in Windows anyway. When you do that, Windows allows you to proceed to the next step with the push of a joystick button. In this case, the virtual buttons for the thumb wheels may cause calibration to end prematurely. When that happens, there is an option in our software to disable all the thumb wheel virtual buttons. When enabled, this option is forcibly unticked if the user clicks recalibrate for any thumb wheel. The tick automatically recovers when all axes finish calibration. It happens a lot when you enter the game, stuff like the toggles in the game are different from their physical counterpart. Things are even worse if the game only supports incremental inputs, but fortunately that's not the case with Falcon BMS. When this enable box is ticked, our software detects mission starts and makes the ICP hardware automatically generate a one-shot signal from all the previously engaged positions. So your mission will be in sync with the hardware from the start. The sync action can also be triggered manually by clicking the trigger button here. This comes in handy, especially for testing. Unlike the ATD, which comes in different backlight versions, the ICP is fitted with RGB LEDs, so you may choose your favorite backlight color with this color scheme. This box below offers a solid preview of the color you've picked. And a few palettes serve as shortcuts to easily save or load some custom colors.
We've picked cyan, endless green, pure and warm white as default settings. To save the current color to a palette, just right click on it. If you are familiar with our ATD, the upper half of the ICP backlight control portion is pretty much the same as with the ATD. You may choose dimming with the auxiliary power supply or adjusting it with this slider. This extra box here offers a dimmed preview of the currently selected color, which resembles the illuminated effect on the actual ICP panel. This green dot here indicates a data node. It means the backlight brightness can be driven by a source like Falcon. It's not supported at this moment yet, but if the panel brightness data within Falcon BMS opens up to us in the future, a simple update of the RSW console will enable us to synchronize the physical brightness of the ICP with the game. Isn't that cool? If you are making adjustment to the brightness through a knob, say on the auxiliary power supply, or through this slider, and you find it too dim at the minimum, you may increase the dead zone setting here. If it appears to be too bright at the max, you may lower the saturation here. If your auxiliary power supply exceeds our recommended voltage range, you will get this warning here. So please keep your inputs in check. The over voltage condition is also indicated with this flashing LED. Now that you're familiar with how the toggles and thumb wheel buttons work, let's take a look at the DCS switch. Mechanically, it really just is an ordinary four-way hat switch. Makes sense for it to show up as a point of view switch in Windows, doesn't it? But then, BMS doesn't like key mapping with POVs, so we've added this little option here where you can make it function as four regular buttons. The two modes are designed to be exclusive. Let's fire up BMS again and get the DCS switch mapped. Scroll down the list. DCS up, oops. DCS down. DCS sequence and DCS return. Move on to a toggle switch. Take Drift Compensation, pick the ON position, flip the toggle up. Now on its way back, I might as well just get NORM mapped too. Click, return to neutral, and go ahead with WARN reset. Now I don't have to worry about NORM being overwritten by the neutral position as the highlight has already been removed. Once again, war and reset should be a latched position. I will replace this particular switch later. Now for the thumb wheel, first make sure the virtual buttons are enabled. Then move the SYM wheel way up so they are ready to trigger the off virtual button. Click on HUD power off. Move the wheel all the way to the bottom, then click on HUD power on, move the wheel up. Just like a walk in the park, right? A fully assembled ICP is composed of the front panel, the main controller board, the back plate, the DCS switch, the toggle switches, the thumb wheels, the breakout box, a number of cables, and accessories. All the custom parts have been precisely machined on professional CNC mills. I have personally designed the circuit boards and programmed the firmware. Placement of the components was done on a professional SMT machine before the circuit boards went through an automated reflow oven. We would take the factory inspected boards, program and test each one of them. The front panel, the main controller board and the mandatory cables are always included as a basic package. 
These countersunk screws, standoffs, nuts, and thumb wheel cables for the main controller board are also part of the basic package. The two versions of backplates are sold separately on our website. In order to fit in the rest of the ICP, four countersunk holes are required for mounting the standoffs, and another six are needed for mounting the front panel. For those of you who have already got your own aluminum backplates, the ICP is available without a backplate. The dimensions of those holes will be provided with the product. However, it is strongly recommended to purchase our pre-drilled backplates together because the holes require a certain degree of precision. If the holes were off, these connectors between the main controller board and the front panel won't line up, and you may end up damaging the connectors if you try to force them in. If the backplate is too thick or warping, they may not fit in deep enough to form a reliable connection either. The thumb wheels are provided as a standalone product so you can use with your own electronics. You don't see this kind of stuff every day, they're not ordinary potentiometers. There's a delicate microcontroller system within each one of them. The center chip is a non-contact magnetic encoder and it doesn't wear out like a pot. It might be slightly sensitive to very strong ambient magnetic fields, but fortunately that's not found in most of your homes. There are five gold-plated pins on the thumb wheel, and each thumb wheel comes with an adapter fitted with five caps, so you don't need to spoil the shiny coating on those pins with solder. The first pin from the left is 5 volt supply, and the third pin on the right is ground. They are reverse protected, but please don't exceed 5.5 volts when using with your own electronics. The center pin on the top is voltage output. It is buffered with an onboard amplifier, so please don't short it with either power supply or the ground, or else you'd risk damage to the amplifier, which voids your warranty. The two pins at the bottom are smart pins. When they are shorted together before power up, the thumb wheel would enter calibration mode upon power up. Most of you guys would never need that, so normally please don't short them together. If you short either one of them to the ground before power up, the other one would work as an emulated switch output. When the thumb wheel retreats into its minimum, this pin would send out a high level as if the switch is opened from the ground. Otherwise, it sends out a low level indicating the switch is engaged. In rare cases, if calibration is really required, short the smart pins with each other before powering up the wheel. Then, move the wheel back and forth after power on. Finally, keep the wheel at one end which you define as its minimum. The calibration will stop in a few seconds, and then, new settings will be saved. The thumb wheel output voltage is close to 0 volt at the minimum end, and 5 volt at the max. The thumb wheels come in mirrored versions. The ones on the left are not interchangeable with those on the right side. I know it's a lot of information to take, but we're doing everything we can to ensure you have the best experiences flying with our hardware. If you wish to learn more about our products, please visit our website or follow us on our Facebook page. Okay, this is Alex. Have fun gaming and thank you for watching. See you later.